Good morning. Good to see everybody out this morning. We appreciate you being here live and in person. And then those that will be joining us online. And if you're getting online, I hope that you will share the program out and remind folks that uh, we are on. I tried to do a uh, uh, preview a while ago and it didn't work out very good on Facebook Live. So I deleted it. But anyhow, good to see you out. What's a beautiful day here in, in Florida. Uh, the sun is shining bright. And just an absolute beautiful day. So we appreciate everybody that's out and getting on. Hope you're having a great day. Good to have Miss Evelyn back. She's out of the frozen north. And good to have her back home with us today. And appreciate that. Let me ask you, let me ask you a favor before we get started out. Some of you did. Some of you did last week. I need you to go to YouTube and try to get signed up on, on my channel, Mike Wharf Ministries. Because I tell you what, here's another reason. Here's another reason what happened. I tried to boost, and and I know that's probably the, maybe not anybody here understands what I'm talking about. Maybe Eddie might, but you can boost your Facebook program. And I thought, man, I want to boost that Sunday morning sermon because man, it would the unsaved people need to hear that. And I wanted to boost that Sunday night end times end times lesson. And they 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 denied me uh, boosting. On, on both of them, I appealed to the one, and they, they went ahead and boosted it on the Sunday night, but they will not boost the Sunday morning. They said I violated their discriminatory practices ads or something. And, 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 and uh, you know, so I keep saying that. Please go get signed up on, on the YouTube channel because I don't know when we may have to switch from Facebook Live to YouTube, Eddie, do you is that what you use as YouTube Live? Yeah, I put some links up there. Okay, so maybe we maybe you and I can get together and we can start looking at that maybe and see how that works. But so go ahead and get get on the YouTube channel if you can, because you know we got so many followers on on Facebook that that I don't want to just switch over because they wouldn't know that. So if I can get you to do that, and then if you can share off of YouTube those sermons. Man, it is easy to share. And, you know, I mean, you share the program here, but once you go to YouTube and you pull one of those sermons up and then you share that, you can share that in an email. You can copy that, share that on a, uh, to messenger, messenger. You can share that on text. And one of our ladies is on this morning, and she shared, she did that last week. And I tell you what, my previous end time sermon had picked up like 175 views in just a, it, since last week. So thank you, Dewana, for doing that and everybody else that did that. But if you would do that, that is a great way for you to get the message out. So don't forget that's Mike Wharf Ministries. So don't forget that. Also, we're still taking up money for our kids at Christmas. I appreciate everybody that's giving. If you want to give, and we'd be glad to have your help. We got about 20 kids that we're buying for. And I believe Miss Jean has started yet. Did you start yesterday, Miss Jean, buying? So Miss Jean started buying yesterday, and then don't forget to pray at three twenty today. Uh, Cheryl says she has no sound. Is, uh, everybody else got sound. It may be you, Cheryl, on your end. Maybe you need to restart. I hope everybody else has got sound. How about it, Pastor Brooks? I see you on there. Do we have sound? Be terrible. We don't have any sound. Is anybody else on? Yes. We got sound. Okay. Good. All right. Good deal. Maybe it's just Cheryl. All right, so, all right, we're going, don't forget to pray at 3.20 today for the church. I've got about 17 P, P's, you know, power, practice, the possessions, the place, the presence, the pattern, the purity, all those things about praying for the church. So continue, continue to pray for the church at 3.20. We had a great service Sunday morning, man. You know, uh, Big D and I were talking yesterday. It, it's when there's excitement, it's contagious. Amen. And man, it was it was exciting Sunday morning. It it really was. Had a great crowd, and we appreciate all the people that were out. So continue to do your part, and continue to to pray for the church. That God will continue to bless. We're going into the into the Christmas season, and uh, it man, it's a great time to to witness to people and get people out out to church. Don't forget our dinner coming up. I just went back and counted. We got about 38 people signed up so far, so let's get a few more people signed up. If you're not signed up, go ahead and sign up. 
And I see Tim Higgins on there. Tim, good to see you, bud. Won't you and your wife come to the dinner with us again this year, Tim? I, we loved having, having you all last year. I thought about calling you. And uh, why don't you come? That's on, uh, on the 16th of December at 6 o'clock. Man, I'd love to have you here. I thought about the other side. I need, to, I need to contact you. So you're on. Maybe the Lord puts you on so I could tell you that this morning. But uh, hope, hopefully you come out. I'll, I'll get in touch with you, all right? So, uh, man, we all, we, we all love Tim. Tim was the SRO at school, and we all love love Tim. And, and uh, Bella's mom is here this morning, Miss Kim, and she started clapping when I said you might come to the dinner. So, But we all love Tim Higgins. God bless you, buddy. So let's pray and get started up, can we? Well, Lord, we're thankful today for your blessings and for these people that have gathered today to hear your word. I pray that you bless each one that's here and those that are online and, Lord, those that may be watching later uh, in the next coming days. Lord, help us to be a blessing, to be able to share your word, Lord, as we talk about spiritual gifts. And, Lord, we ask you today, bless all those on our prayer list. Thank you for the first lady got that list out today. Wow, what, a, what an exhaustive list. And as I as I was looking through that and, and thinking about that this morning, I, again, I just say thank you, Lord, that my name is not on there. It could be any time. It could be any day. But, Lord, today it's not, and I thank you for that. But I pray for everybody that's on there. I pray that you'll bless them and help them and give them exactly what they need. Pray for our church. Lord, thank you for the excitement of things that are going on, people uh, being saved and rededicated, renewed, and getting on fire. And, Lord, help us to be a witness for you. And, Lord, bless our country and our nation. Uh, bless the Ukraine. And, Lord, we just pray, God, that you would uh, help us, Lord, to do what we can to get the gospel out. In Jesus' name. Amen, amen and amen. Well, I want to say this morning, we've had a couple uh, of, of our folks die. Kim Carreri, one of our classmates, died last week. And uh, Ernie's, Ernie's going to church with us here when he's in town. And uh, But he passed away. Then my other classmate's wife passed away the other day. And then I heard this morning one of our, uh, he was a little bit older than me, passed away uh, from back home. So... You know, when, you're, when your peers and people that you hang out with start passing away, you go, wow, I'm moving to the front of the line. And uh, so I want, I'd like for you to pray for those families. Gary Moore passed away last night. And uh, then, like I said, uh, Keith White's wife, Donna, passed away. And then the Carreri family. But anyhow, we're going to get started up. Are you ready to get started this morning? All right, here's a, here's a question I'm going to ask you. Now, I'm going to ask you a lot of questions today, but here's a couple to get you thinking. Do you know why you were born? To serve God. Huh? To serve God. To serve God, exactly. You were born to bring glory to God. Now, you might be doing, you might be doing a lot of other things, that may take you in a lot of avenues. Your talents, uh, the, the way that you have grown up, may place you in a lot of places. I've thought about. I got a message from one of our teachers today, and and you know that's a place where you can be. Any place you are in life, you can serve God. But the main reason that you were born was to serve God and to bring glory. To God. So, not only that, let me ask you another question. If you remember this from last week, how many ministers do we have in, in here this morning? Well, let's get our hands up. Only one that had to get their hands up, Eddie. He only has one that he can use. It. But we, everybody here, remember, we're a minister because that word minister means what? Servant. 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 So, we're all ministers, we're all servants. Let me read our text that we read last week and kind of get jumped in to where we need to go. It's in 1 Corinthians chapter number 12, verses 1 through 8. So if you got your Bible, I should have told you that a while ago and you'd have been ready. 1 Corinthians 12, 1 through 8. Starts out, Paul said, Now concerning spiritual gifts, there it is. Brethren, I'd not have you ignorant. Remember, ignorant means it, it means you just don't know. So Paul wants you to know what your spiritual gift is. Verse 2, you know that ye were Gentiles carried away into these dumb idols, even as ye were led. Wherefore, I give, I give you to understand that no man speaking by the Spirit of God calleth Jesus accursed, and that no man can say that Jesus is the Lord but by the Holy Ghost. 
Now, there are diversities of gifts. What's that mean, diversities? Different. Different, different gifts, but the same Spirit. Spirit. They all come from the Holy Spirit of God. And verse number five, and there are differences of administrations. There are different ways as those are administered and as those are used, but the same Lord. Verse number six, and there are diversities of operations, but it's the same God which worketh all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. They're given so that everybody can be blessed and everybody can be helped to profit everyone. Verse number seven, no, verse number eight. For to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom, to another the word of knowledge by the same Spirit. Then I want to jump down to verse 11. But all these worketh that one and the self same Spirit, dividing to every man severally as he will. So the Holy Ghost of God, the Holy Spirit of God, gives out spiritual gifts to people as he sees fit, as God sees fit to gift you. Now, I asked six, six questions last week. I'm just going to run through them real fast and get to our other ones this week. Number one, I asked, what is a spiritual gift? It's a supernatural gift that God gives you. Number two, when do Christians get their spiritual gift? At the moment of conversion, at salvation. When you get saved, God gives you and imparts to you a spiritual, everybody, a spiritual gift, or maybe some people have more than one. So the next question, how many Christians have at least one spiritual gift? Everybody. Everybody. Everybody has at least one spiritual gift. Number four, can a Christian have more than one spiritual gift? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, you can have more than one. Can the question number five, can a Christian have all of the spiritual gifts? No, I don't th I don't think one person would have them all because they're given to everybody so that, you know, it's kind of like a glove. You put it on, that glove fits in there, and everybody's doing what they can. And that's the way the body of Christ is supposed to work. So they're given to people individually so that we can work together to help the body of Christ. And then we finished up with question number six. Are spiritual gifts the same as talents? No, but Brother Clarence answered that. They can, they can coincide. They can work together. They can complement each other. But a, a spiritual gift is not a talent. You may have a talent to do a lot of things. It may not be a spiritual gift, but you may use that it, with your spiritual gift to carry that out. There are a lot of people that are talented that are not saved. Am I right? So a talent and a spiritual gift is not the same thing, although they can, can coincide. I want to try and get through some more questions this week as we lay the groundwork for, to get into the spiritual gifts. But question number seven, here it is right here. This is a new one. Are spiritual gifts rewards that can be earned? Are spiritual gifts rewards that we have to earn? No, you're right. No, they're not. They're not something that you have to earn. Again, if you had to earn it, it wouldn't be a gift. It's a gift. A spiritual gift is a, is a gift given by the Spirit of God, given to you. It's a grace gift. Remember we talked about that word last week, charisma. Charis, which means grace. It's a grace gift that the Spirit of God gives to you. And it's not, people say, well, you know, I have to do this. Do you have to, let me just throw this in. We talked about this last week. Do we have to pray for a spiritual gift? No, there's no use to pray and ask God for a spiritual gift. You already have it. Now you might want to pray and ask God to help you discover it and to help you develop it. But there's no use praying and saying, well, you know, you know, I want, I want Clarence's gift. I want Bill's gift. You know, I, I, I want somebody else. There's no use doing that because when you got saved, God gives you the gift that he wants you to have. Does that make sense? Yes. Good. Question number eight. Now, here's, here's one we'll take just a little bit more time on. Some of these questions are quick and some of them are a little bit more lengthy to answer. Number eight, are spiritual gifts the same as spiritual fruit? 
Are spiritual gifts the same as spiritual fruit? Sp spiritual fruit. No. Let me read to you what the spiritual fruits are. You might want to jot these verses down. Galatians 5, verse 22 and 23. But the fruit of the Spirit. Kathy had a good devotion on the other day about that. Sometimes we, we get confused about that. It doesn't say the fruits of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit. But the fruit of the Spirit. Listen to this. Here's, here. If you're saved and the Holy Ghost of God living in you, you, these fruits ought to be manifesting themselves in your life, right? right? Okay, so the fruit of the Spirit is love. Jesus said, by this you all may know that you're my disciples, if you have love. love. It wouldn't be hard for me. Could you be a Christian and not have love? No. Be, I can't imagine that. So the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, Long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. So there they are. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. Nine spiritual fruits, or, or nine fruits. I'm, I, I, I can't even say that right. The fruit of the Spirit consist of nine things. Nine things. Nine things. So a spiritual gift is not a spiritual fruit. If you've been saved and born again, though that fruit of the Holy Ghost of God is living in you, you know, if you plant an apple tree, are you going to get apples off of it? Yeah, that's hopefully. So, you know, God's placed the fruit of the Spirit in our life, and as He works in us and manifests Himself through us and we allow Him to, then we have... We see these gifts coming out, not these gifts, these fruit of the Spirit that's coming out and they've been manifest in our life, love and joy and peace and all those things, nine things. So now let me say this as we're talking about spiritual gifts are not the same as spiritual fruit. Let me remind you of something that you're probably aware of, but maybe you have forgotten. Now, I, want you to, I want you to listen to me. As a Christian... Every one of us will stand before the judgment seat of Jesus Christ. You don't hear a lot of preaching about that today. You don't hear a lot of teaching about that today. You don't hear a lot of people talking about that today. There are people that say, well, you know, I got saved, but it doesn't matter. I got saved, so it doesn't matter how I live. Yeah. Is that true? Yeah. No. Chapter and verse. Chapter and verse 2 Corinthians 5.10. Galatians 5, 22 and 23. Galatians 5, 22 and 23. Now, but we will be going to 2 Corinthians 5, 10. Let me go ahead and read it to you. For we must all appear, Paul's talking to Christians, the Corinthian church, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body, According to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Now, I'm going to tell you something. That ought to bring that ought to bring a little shudder of fear into the way we serve the Lord. Now, there are people who say you get saved, and you know you're saved by grace, and you're kept by grace, and that's all true. That's absolutely true. So it doesn't matter how you live your life. Well, it does matter because your rewards in heaven for eternity are going to be based on what you've done in your Christian life and how you've lived for Jesus. So, you know, people say, well, you know, I'm just going to live like I want. Man, listen, there's going to come a day. There's going to come a day when everyone that's saved will stand before Jesus. And that's not the great white throne judgment. There are two judgments. The great white throne judgment is for unsaved people. The judgment seat of Christ is for saved people. At the judgment seat, of, you know, I, I thought to the night, I, I, I don't know if I told it in the lesson Sunday night. Do you, you know when that's going to take place, right? After the rapture of the church. When the rapture of the church, we're in heaven, 
tribulations going on on earth and the judgment seat of Christ will be taking place in heaven during that time and then we will be wed to Jesus. We'll, be the, the, we'll have the, that wedding will take place. So when you think about that, it ought to make us concerned about how we live our Christian life. It ought to make us concerned about what we do. It ought to make us concerned about where we go. It ought to make us concerned about what we say. It ought to make us concerned about how many people heard the podcast this morning? Wow. Where's the rest of you? All right, I'll, let, I'll give you a break. But the, the podcast today was on the fall of David, King David. And here's what got David. He was lazy. He should have gone to battle. He, it was a time when kings were going to war. He decided he wasn't going to go. He stayed home. He saw Bathsheba. He looked. When he saw Bathsheba bathing herself and a beautiful woman, guess what kicked in? Wow, the hormones kicked in. And he began to lust after Bathsheba. And the things you lust after, you will begin to lean after. And then the next thing you know, David had committed adultery with Bathsheba and cost him way more than what he wanted to pay. So we need to be careful that we don't get lazy after we get saved. And, 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 and you know, that's why we don't work to get saved, but we work because we are saved. It's a, it's a way we show our appreciation, our thanks to the Lord. So the judgment... Seed of Christ is not for salvation. We want to put a hand up and say, praise the Lord. We were judged at the cross of Calvary. Our sins, when Jesus died on the cross of Calvary, he paid the sin debt. All we have to do is appropriate that into our life and apply that into our life, and our sins have been taken care of. Aren't you glad? Aren't you glad that the Bible, I mean, I'm about to get on a sidetrack. Aren't you glad that the Bible says that God takes your sins and casts them as far as the east is from the west? Amen. Did you ever think about, did I ever share that with you? It doesn't say the north and the south. I don't know if you know this or not. If you go north and south far enough, you'll eventually run into north and south again. If you go east and west, you will never, ever come to each other again. Our sins have been taken and cast totally away. I don't know about you, but there's some things in my past, in my life, that, I, man, that I'm glad not going to be brought up and drug up because the blood of Jesus has forgiven me and taken care of that. Now, I'll tell you what, the, the devil, the de Big D, the devil's a pretty good fisher. Yeah. He'll fish him up. You ever, you ever have your past sins to come back at night or in, when you're thinking and, 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 and you think, oh. And you know, I think, devil, what a trick. Because it'll discourage you. And then you got to think about, man, our sins have been forgiven. The blood of Jesus covered that. How many sins did they cover? All. What is all? Was that my past sins? Is that my present sins? Are those my future sins? Amen. I tell you what, we'll take a lap right there. So we're going to all give an account of what we've done for the Lord when we stand before him at the judgment seat of Christ. It's not for salvation. It's for service. How did you use your spiritual gift that you were given. Wow. Therefore, that's why these lessons are so important. Therefore, it's extremely important that we discover our spiritual gift, that we develop our spiritual gift, and then that we deploy our spiritual gift. Well, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to put another D on there. If you don't, and you let it lie dormant, you're going to give an account for that. Amen? Amen. 
Amen. You know, you're talking about, talking about not, you know, we talked last week about not, no, not opening the gifts or Christmas gifts that our, our loved one might get us and how embarrassing and how sad that would be if they found out Jesus knows. And he's going to ask you, be real, why did you not use what I gave you? Why did you not do, I gave you a gift, a spiritual gift of grace, and you didn't use it in my service. Wow. I just have to tell you, there's not going to be an excuse big enough on that day. You can blame everybody. You can blame your husband, blame your wife, blame your job, blame, blame the church, blame the pastor. I didn't understand. There's not going to be an excuse when you stand before the Lord Jesus. And man, he begins, I tell you, it's, it's, not going to be, it's not going to be a very pleasant time for a lot of us because we need to be in service for the Lord. Amen? So the Holy Spirit gives each of us a gift to minister to others and to Jesus for with our spiritual gift. And that, which brings me to this point I want to say, a spiritual gift is given, it's the primary way that the Holy Spirit ministers through us. Aren't you glad that you don't have to minister and serve the Lord through your own strength? Our strength comes from the Lord. Our ability comes from the Lord. God has given us everything we need to do it. We just need to do it. Th think about this for just a minute. Jesus has gone back to heaven. Is Jesus walking around on earth today? No. No. Is Jesus' audible voice present in the world today? Watch how you say that because I might have to correct you. No, we have the word of God. We don't have open visions today. We don't have visions where God is speaking to people today because he spoke to us through Jesus and through the word of God. We don't need anything else today. Be careful when any preacher, any Christian says to you, and sometimes we say this, and I hope you mean it. We say, well, God told me to do this. God, God didn't tell you to do anything audibly. Now, he might impress upon your spirit. He might lead you through the Holy Spirit and, and impress upon you to do something. He might, you, it might sound so real that it sounds you hear him in your mind, but God doesn't come down and say, hey, Mike, you need to go teach that Tuesday morning truths this morning, 10 o'clock. No. He doesn't speak audibly anymore. And I'm going to tell you, and the Bible bears that out. Since we have the canon of Scripture, the Word of God. Man, listen, Peter said we have a more. He said we were eyewitnesses. We were there. We handled him. We were with him. But yet we have a more sure word of prophecy. That's why That's why you can't. I shouldn't say this, but I'm gonna, that's why you can't trust preachers. They'll tell you something. They'll tell you something, but it's not Bible. And if it's not Bible, they will, you know, well, God told me that. Listen, and, and I hope if you say, well, God told me that, I hope, I, hope, I hope what you mean, and I think probably what most of us mean, God impressed upon me, or I felt led to do that. You ever done, have you ever felt led to do something? You just feel like God's leading you to do this? Yeah, yeah, but it's, God didn't come down and sit on your coffee table this morning and, and say, now go do this. You know, no, we've got the Word of God and the Spirit of God. But think about this. Je think how cool this is. Jesus has gone back to heaven. There's not an audible voice speaking down. We don't have prophets today in the sense that we had them before the Bible was completed in the Old Testament and some the, the apostles in the New Testament where God was speaking directly to them to speak to the people. Think about that. Why did God speak directly to the prophets and to the apostles to speak to the people? Because they didn't have the word of God completed. So they had to have somebody that was speaking for God. And they were today. This, this right here is what speaks for God. Amen. As preachers and Christians, we just tell what's already been told. Amen. That's all we can do. So I'm getting hung up on that topic. I need to move on. But think how cool this is, that Jesus is in heaven. He has left the work of the ministry to us. If it's going to get done, guess who's going to do it? Us. us. If it doesn't get done, guess who's going to get blamed? Us. us. 
We are the we are the mouth of Jesus in this world today. We are the hands of Jesus in this world today. We are the feet of Jesus in this world today. When we help somebody, when we give to somebody, when we do something to be a blessing to somebody, we are acting in behalf of the Lord Jesus Christ. And man, how cool is that? We're his representatives. We're his ambassadors. You know what an ambassador is? If you studied civics or government in school, an ambassador is somebody sent to another country to represent their country. Well, we're here from heaven. We're ambassadors of heaven, of the king of kings. And our job is to be here in this foreign land, this foreign country, to tell people about Jesus Christ. We're part of his body. No, no, think about this. The Bible says we are laborers and co-laborers with Jesus. Think about that. A co-laborer. Laborers together. First Corinthians 3, 9 says, For we are laborers together with God. I, I, Je, Jesus ministers to people through people. Yeah, have you ever been sitting around and somebody comes in, some something comes up in your mind, or a person, and you think, ought to, maybe I ought to be praying for them. Maybe they need prayer. You don't even have to know, but I believe, I believe that's the way God impresses upon us, puts stuff on your mind, and you think about that. You go to somebody and say, you know, maybe you need help. Maybe I need to do this. There have been so many people that somebody's come by and given them something, and it's exactly what they needed. It's exactly what they needed. Somebody way over here felt impressed to go way over here and give somebody something, and they said, wow, that's exactly what we needed. That happened. Thank you for giving. Thank you for allowing us to use your money to serve the Lord. That happened to us not long ago. I gave somebody something, and they said, that's exactly what we needed. I saw I just felt like we ought to give that to you. Isn't that, isn't that great that we are able to minister to other people in the name of the Lord Jesus and be a part of the, the, the team of heaven? How awesome is that? So let me ask you a question. Are you using your gifts? They're not, they're not talents. They're spiritual gifts that God has given you. Question number 10. Uh-oh. Question number nine was how does the Holy Spirit minister to us through others? That, that maybe I jumped down and covered that one in that. Okay, question number nine. I'm sorry, I jumped, I jumped right in through it and just went right through the question. Question number nine was how does the Holy Spirit minister through us to others? And I've been on that for about ten minutes. I gave you the answer before I gave you the question. I always loved that in school, didn't you? Get the answer. Get the answer, man. Don't worry about the question. Give me the answer and then I'll be all right. So. All right. So when you think about that, let me say that and try to cap that question. Question number nine off, that a spiritual gift is the primary way that the Holy Spirit ministers through us, through you, to other people. That's the, that's the primary way that he does it. Your gift and what you do and what you do for the Lord is the primary way the Holy Spirit ministers through you to minister to other people. Good? All right. Huh? What's the last two of Jesus? Good point. Never heard anybody say that before. I like that. Cliff said the last two letters in Jesus' name is us. Man, that's profound. I have never heard that in my life. And that brought out. How many is that a new truth? Anybody, anybody else ever thought about that? I never thought about that. I like that. I like that. Very good. Good comment, Cliff. Wow. Us. The last two letters in Jesus' name. Wow. Number 10. Why are spiritual gifts given to Christians? This kind of goes along with number 9. 9 and 10 kind of go together, but there's a little bit different avenue. And I'm going to use a word on you, and then I'm going to explain to you and give you some verses to back it up. Why are spiritual gifts given to Christians? For the edification of others. 
for the edification of others, to build up the body of Christ, to build up the church. Does anybody want to take a shot in the dark what edify or edification means? Right. Encourage, lift up, to build up. To edify somebody, you encourage them, you build them up. So we are given these gifts to build up. Now let me ask you a question. By the way, I ask a lot of questions, don't I? Are you building up or are you tearing down? I can tell you, I've been in ministry 45 years, I've seen people tear down. I'm going to tell you something. I'm, pretty, I'm a pretty good terror downer. That's not good English, but, you know, if you said, I got a house that needs to be torn down, give me a sledgehammer, give me a, give me a backhoe, give me, give, me, give me something. Man, I could tear that thing all to pieces. But then if you said, but then if you said, would you build it back? I said, well, a whole lot easier to tear it down than build it back. We'd have to go get some people that were talented and gifted in that area that I wouldn't be gifted in. And it's the same way in church. Can I, can I just stop for just a minute and say this to you? That's why we need to be so cautious and so careful in dealing with folks and people in church. It's so easy to tear down. And we don't even mean to tear it down. And you can tear it down. It's so, you can be misunderstood. Something can be misconstrued. Something can be misunderstanding. Think about all those misses I just threw in there. And, and you know, the next thing you know, somebody's got their feelings hurt. Somebody's upset. We've torn down. We're arguing about what color tablecloths we're going to get. We're arguing about uh, what color the floor is going to be painted. We're arguing about th this. Uh, are any of those things of spiritual value? No. Do you believe I've seen that stuff happen in 45 years in the ministry? Churches are split over what color carpet they're going to put down. When we were building our church back home, and, and we had been in, we, we didn't start out in a place nearly this good. We started out in a little, it used to be, I don't even know what it was. It had barbed wire fence around it. And, and what, what was it? Armory. It was an old armory building. And, uh, man, it was cold in the winter and hot in the summer and had old rickety metal chairs. You know, those old kind of members, and every time you moved, it was like, like something happening. I mean, the air conditioner kick on, and you couldn't hear unless it was me, and then you could hear me over top of it. But, but uh, you know, so we had been in that building for, what, about three years, two or three years. And when we got ready to move out and we bought a piece of property and begin to build our church, Nobody complained about what color. Nobody complained about that. Because as one of our guys said, everything we're doing is going to be so much better than what we've got. But I've seen, after you've been in church for a while, say, well, you know, we're going to change the color of the carpet. And when somebody says, well, I, as, I, as I tell people, listen, if you, if, you, if you want to change the colors of the carpet runners in there, just go buy them. You want pink? Just go buy pink. We'll put them down. It won't bother me. Well, if you you know you want something, you know. But Lord, just don't fight about it. I don't care if you put polka dot down. It would make would it make any difference if, if it was polka dot? No, but people get in this thing. I better get off of that. So, but isn't it easier to tear down a church than it is to build up? It takes work. It takes work to build. It'll take work to tear up. Like I said, man, I can man, I'm like a like a hammer and a, an anvil, just in a bull in a china shop, just tearing up. You, putting it back together is a whole different thing. Kathy can tell you, I take all kinds of. I want to take it apart and see how it works. I can fix it. Something tears up. I can fix that. Well, yeah, yeah. The, the only problem is I don't know why they put so many extra parts in everything. Because when I go to put it back together, there's always extra stuff. And most of the time, it's put back together, thrown away as it is, or put in a corner somewhere. I better begin on that. But listen, think about that. As, think, about, think about that when we think about the human body. Think about our hands, how great our hands are. You, you know, let me take a swipe at atheists and, and evolutionists that don't believe that God created this body. I mean, I'm sitting looking at Eddie, and as quick as I look at him, I, I, not only, I not only see him, and it comes back to my mind, and immediately I know it's Eddie sitting over there. I look at Gwen, and immediately, I don't have to sit and go. Well, 
Who is that? Isn't it amazing how quick that body? I mean, you, I look at Cliff and I don't have to say anything. Who is that? Well, I may get like that one time, some at some point. But but you know, but I'm talking about generally if the body's in working order. You touch something, and it, aren't you glad you don't have to touch it and hold it on something hot for five, ten seconds to to it finally comes back? All it runs back up your arm and through all your nerves and back into your brain. Your brain says, "Move your finger." No, as soon as you touch it, you just. I think that's like the most amazing thing in the world. Think about that for just a minute. Take your hand and cut it off, and lay it over here on the side. What good is it? What good does your hand do? Take your foot and, 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 and you know, lose your foot and put it on the side. So what good is it? Eddie's got his arm in a sling again where he broke his shoulder. Ask him if he needs that other arm. Uh, yes. You know you can lose your little toe and it'll mess you up in your walking? You say, what are you trying to get? I'm trying to get to this. The body is made to function together. Your hands, if you don't have your hands attached to the body, they're no good. Take your eyeballs and lay them out at night and put them on the dresser and say, I'll put them back in the morning. I, 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 nothing, is, nothing that we have is good attack, detached from the body. And it's the same way with our spiritual gifts. Our spiritual gifts are meant to be used as a body. I said last week, I can't do it all. Neither am I supposed to do it all. You can't do it all. Neither are you supposed to do it all. But if we're all using our gift, then it all works together like a body. We need to be attached. Nobody's an island. I don't need anybody. Man, I ain't never said that. I ain't never said that because I don't need anybody. Well, that's the most stupid thing you could probably ever say in your life. I'm a self-made man. Well, you, you need to thank God that you made it because without him, you wouldn't have made it. Amen. So when Paul wrote to the Corinthians, I'm going to go to 1 Corinthians 14 here and finish up here probably. <clears throat> when Paul wrote to the Corinthians, now I'm going to kind of set the background. If you don't know this, as you read through the book of Corinthians, man, that church was a mess. I mean, man, they were, a, I mean, from the, the every angle, every way you could imagine, they were a mess. You got to realize they had, they had lived and been saved out of paganism and, and idol worship and, and meats that were offered into, into pagan sacrifice. I mean, they were a mess. They were carnal. They were worldly. They had a guy in the church that was living in a sexual way with his father's wife. Read about it. And Paul had to set that straight. And he said, you guys are acting like you're rejoicing and you need to deal with it. You don't just let that go. You deal with that. And Paul was writing this letter. When it came to spiritual gifts, oh, they were so confused. They were confused. Let me let me begin to read 1 Corinthians 14, 1 through 5. Now let me give you another piece of backdrop. 1 Corinthians 13 is the love chapter, the charity chapter. The Paul says, though I have all these things and don't have charity, I don't have anything. Though I give my body to be burned and do all this stuff, I don't have charity, I don't have anything. Love is the great thing of the Christian life. Amen? But then he says, follow after charity. And desire what? Desire what? Spiritual. Spiritual gifts. But rather that ye may prophesy. Well, I'm going to comment, but I'm going to read another verse. For he that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not unto men, but unto God. For no man understandeth him, howbeit in the spirit he speaketh mysteries. Now I'm going to give you a Bible lesson real fast here. How many people got your, How many people see the word in their Bibles got unknown in italics? Unknown in, that means it wasn't in the original manuscript. 
That means that the that when they translate, when the King James translators translate it out, sometimes coming from Hebrew or from Greek into English language, they had to have something to make the sentence run together. Any place they did, that's what I love about the KJV, one of the things I love about it. Any place they did that, the word is in italics. That makes a lot of sense in the day and age in which we're living. Uh, unknown tongues is not unknown tongues. It was tongues. It was a language. People say, it's unknown tongue. No, it's not an unknown tongue. Unknown is not even in the original. They just put that in there to help it run together. But when it run together, people say, oh, it's an unknown tongue. Nobody knows it. No, Paul was saying he speaks in a tongue, in a language. Speaking not to men, but to God. For no man understands it. If, some, if somebody came in this morning and started speaking Ukrainian or even Spanish, now I, I could pick up Piquito, you know. But, you know, somebody come in and start, would you know what they were saying? What benefit would it do to you? It would do you none. That's what Paul's saying. Listen, if you speak in these languages, Paul said, I speak in language in morning. He spoke all kinds of languages. He was learned. But if you're speaking, some, if I was in Home Depot a couple weeks ago, and this lady, it looks like us. We're standing there getting a key made. In fact, it was the other day after, Bill was telling me about a lady in town that can cut a key. And she had taken one of these funny looking keys and was trying to get the guy to make it. And, and she was struggling with that. And he didn't know if he could. And he was trying to tell her where to get it. And I said, well, you can get it cut from a lady in town. And she looked at me and she said, I'm sorry, I don't understand what you're saying. And I looked at her and said, am I speaking a foreign language? And she said, I'm French. She said, I only know a few words. <laughs> yeah, and I felt so bad because, you know, I was trying to help her out, but what I was telling her, have a good day. What I was telling her was of no benefit because she couldn't understand me. And it's the same way Paul said, you want to use these languages and come into church and, and speak in all these different languages. God can understand. Can God understand Hebrew? Yes. Yeah. Can God understand Greek? Yes. Can God understand English? Yes. Can God understand hillbilly? Yes. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. So, you know, if you're speaking in some some language that nobody understands, you're not. It, it's not benefiting you. Sure, God knows, but it's not benefiting you. Verse 13. But he that prophesieth speaketh unto men to edification. Look at that word, edification. Mark it down, underline it. And exhortation and comfort. That's why we preach and teach the word of God. Prophecy today, prophesying today is for, not foretelling, but forth telling. We don't, we don't prophesy like future events because we know the end. I just Sunday night spent an hour on end time events. We know the end. So we don't prophesy as like we're telling the future, like we're some wizard or some warlock. That's, that's witchcraft stuff. But we do forth tell what's already been told. So then he said in verse 14, he that speaketh in an unknown tongue edifieth who? Himself. Himself. But he that prophesieth, there's that word again, edifieth who? The church. the church. Paul said in verse 5, I would that you all spake with tongues. Be great if everybody had a tongue differently. I wish I could. I'm gonna tell you what. When I came to Florida and got into the education system, I thought I should have taken Spanish years ago. Because <laughs> if I wanted to talk to somebody, we had to go get an interpreter. And I'd have somebody. I'd have somebody in my office. I'd have an interpreter in my office, and I'd have somebody on the phone. And I'd tell the interpreter what to say, and then she'd tell them, tell them in Spanish. And I'm sitting there watching, her, and I'm thinking, I wonder if she's really telling it what I'm saying. And I wonder if, there, if, if it's coming across the way I want it to come across. So think about that. Verse 5, I would that you all spake with tongues, but rather that you what? Prophesy. Prophesy. For greater is he that prophesies than he that speaketh with tongues, except the interpret. Now, if you want to come in and speak, you want to come in and speak uh, uh, Russian or, or Japanese to me, and you can interpret it, find, do, tell me what you're saying. But don't come in and speak Japanese around me because I won't know what you're saying. And I hate to go into a store and get around people 
get on elevator with people and they start talking in their foreign language. Because I don't know if they're talking. I think, do I stink? <laughs> Is it me? Are they talking about me? But, uh, you, you know, it, that's just, but, you know, that's why we preach and teach the word of God. That the church may receive what? Edifying. There's that word again. Notice how many times you're saying that word. Verse number 12. Even so ye, for as much as ye are zealous of spiritual gifts, seek that ye may excel to the edifying of the church. So there's that word again. Edifying. First Corinthians 14, 26. Here's another one. How is it then, brethren, when you come together, every one of you hath a psalm, hath a doctrine, hath a tongue, hath a revelation, hath an interpretation. Let all things be done unto edifying. What's edifying mean? Building up. Whatever we do when we come together ought to be to build up. Here's another verse. Ephesians 4, 11 and 12. Ephesians 4, 11 and 12. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the, nobody's there with me, edifying of the body of Christ. We'll make a couple comments. I'm going to close. Spiritual gifts are not given for personal or self-edification or glorification. They're given to edify the body of Christ. Spiritual gifts are not given to put you on a pedestal. Spiritual gifts are not given so people say, wow, look at you. Spiritual gifts are not given so you say, look what I can do. Spiritual gifts are given to you that you might edify the body of Christ. That you might build up and encourage and help everybody else. They're not given to build up yourself. The Corinthians had that. That was one of the, they were, they were wanting to brag and boast about their, themselves and the gifts that they had. If it's a gift, how can you brag about it? So they're not given to build up yourself, but to build up others. You've not been given a spiritual gift for personal enjoyment, but for your employment in service for Jesus. Spiritual gifts are not given for you to get personal enjoyment out of, but they're given to you for your employment in serving Jesus Christ. Spiritual gifts are not given as evidence for salvation. They're given to equip you for service. You don't look at somebody and say, well, they got a spiritual gift. That's evidence that they must be living around serving the Lord. No, they're, they're not given as an evidence of your salvation. And you won't go back to the fruit of the Spirit and say that could be the evidence of your salvation. Spiritual gifts are given for to equip you for service. Amen? Amen. So let me say again, spiritual gifts, get that today. Spiritual gifts are given to minister to the body of Christ. Amen? Amen. Man, I had one more question, two more questions to get, get through, and I didn't get through them. So, but we're going to start on, on, on the gifts here soon. Soon. I think we finish up next week's lesson and we'll be ready to start. And I thank you for being here. I hope, I hope that you've got something out of that today. I hope as I keep setting the stage and, and trying just to hammer home the point that we need to, we need to, to discover, develop, and deploy our spiritual gifts. And then Paul used that word desire. Desire. Let me give you let me give you a tidbit of information and probably go into next week's lesson, something so you can think about. If you desire to do something, you think that's maybe God speaking to you, getting your attention, that maybe that might be your gift. You have a desire, you say, I have a desire that I want to do this. Now they, they, you can get fleshly desires in the way and lustful desires in the way, but if you're truly seeking the Lord. And you feel like, man, I want to do this. Maybe that, maybe God has given you that desire that's going to lead you to discover what your spiritual gift is. Does that make sense? You know, so as you're doing that and you have this desire, then you, you say, wow, maybe I'm gifted in that area. Then you begin to develop that. You begin to use that, deploy that, utilize it in the in the in the church in the kingdom of God. And I'm gonna tell you what I'm gonna say again. I said last week, and I'm gonna I'm gonna stop. Try to 
The happiest people are those who know what their spiritual gifts are and are using them in service for the Lord. So don't be disheartened. Don't be discouraged. Don't be down and out. You say, I still don't know what mine is. We haven't gotten to them yet, but we're going to get there. If you hang on, we're going to get there, and you're going to see them, and then you'll go, oh, wow. I do have that. Or you're going to go, man, well, that's not me. And then you're going to also be able to look at somebody and say, oh, yeah. I, you know what, spirit, I'm getting beside myself, and I'm going to quit after a while. <laughs> Here's the reason why you need to be familiar with spiritual gifts. It helps you understand people in the church. You look at people and say, well, why are they always doing that? Well, maybe that's their spiritual gift. Now, there's a, there's a benefit to having spiritual gifts, and we'll also be talking about some things that happen that can get you in trouble with your spiritual gift if you're not careful. Because sometimes if you're gifted in an area, you want everybody to be gifted in that area, and that don't, doesn't happen. And I've seen that happen, and people get upset. That was a bad thing. We, years ago, they used to have hot dog sales to support the church and to feed people and would do that. And you had the same few people every week that cooked and baked and did all that. Well, after a while, that group of people began to complain against the other people who were not, well, where, where's so-and-so? How come so-and-so's not here helping? How come so-and-so's not doing anything? They never show up. That's not the way to use your gift. If you if you got a gift, use it and use it and enjoy it and say, God, thank you that you placed me into the body and given me a spiritual gift. And I hope you have a great day. May God bless you. We love you. See you Wednesday night. Don't forget Wednesday night, seven o'clock, Facebook Live, prop night.